I am not in the business of judging ideas. I am in the business of choosing entrepreneurs that I feel are going to take action because the single mm. most important quality of an entrepreneur, of a fundraiser, of whoever, like really whoever, is the ability to take action. Welcome, everyone. I am so thrilled to be here today with Shannon Lore. Um, Shannon, I'd really just like to start with you giving a little intro to yourself and to your work, and then we're going to dive right in because I know there is so much for us to talk about today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Mallory. Um, so I am the founder and CEO of Factory 45, the online business school that takes sustainable fashion brands from idea to launch. I uh, started the program back in 2014, and I've worked with entrepreneurs all over the globe to launch sustainable and ethical fashion brands. So that is so amazing. And I'm curious, like, I want to hear a little bit more about your story around like why this is particularly important to you and the focus of like your life's work right now. Yeah, it's really funny that it is my life's work, like 10 <laughs> years. I mean, it's crazy. I, so I started my own sustainable fashion brand back in 2010. Um, at the time, you did not even put the word sustainable and fashion together. Like no mm. one knew what that meant. Um, and I really didn't know what it meant. I had set out to start a business with uh, my then co-founder, we weren't really sure what it looked like. We did not have any interest in sustainability. We were not fashion mm. majors or fashion designers. We really just saw a need in the market um, for something that we ourselves wanted, which was a versatile travel garment that you could just throw in a backpack. We were both backpackers. Uh, I had bartended my way around the world for two years. Like we were just kind of two college grads who wanted to keep traveling. And so fast forward, we ended up launching the highest funded fashion project in Kickstarter history at the time. We were featured in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal. It was like this whole whirlwind experience. But what I realized from that was that it should be easier for people to start fashion brands that are mm -hmm. sustainably and ethically made from the beginning. Um, and that's sort of what led me to launch Factory 45 to help other entrepreneurs start businesses with a social entrepreneurship, social impact focus um, and do it the right way from the start. Mm. Okay. I know this is not the point of the podcast, but I'm dying to ask you, where were you backpacking? Cause I also had a little seven month backpacking adventure and I'm like, I want that garment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like when you're in like your early twenties, like you don't yes. need much. Yeah. Um, so we, my co-founder and I met both when we were in Australia, um, mm. in Manly outside Sydney. And then I also went to Southeast Asia, South Africa. Mm. It was a two year, uh, jaunt for sure. Amazing. Amazing. I love that. And maybe even starting with, I'd love to hear a little bit about why is it so hard to sort of create that like a brand or a product that's rooted in sort of sustainable and ethical practices? Like, why is that so hard for someone to break into? I think that for the most part, and this has changed since I set out to do this, but there are a lot of just closed doors in the manufacturing industry, mm. especially when it comes to fashion, like everyone's so secretive and competitive. And then you add in the sustainability aspect, you're always going to pay more for sustainable fabrics. Mm. If you are looking at ethical manufacturing, you're going to pay more because those workers, the sewers are actually being paid a fair and living wage. Mm. So I think it's, it, it's a very a nuanced and complicated conversation, but, um, thankfully, since I set out to do this, you know, a decade ago, we've come a long way. And, uh, you know, thanks to different resources and different manufacturers prioritizing ethical manufacturing, as well as fabric suppliers prioritizing more sustainable fabrics. Mm. And then the innovation has just, you know, made made progress. Mm. So you're leading me to this other question, which is, okay, so 
in the marketplace, if you're not going to be providing something that is sort of the race to the bottom from a cost perspective, Mm -hmm. and I'm sure at the time that you were sort of building reputation around sustainable and ethical clothing, there were probably questions about quality and durability and, and all of those pieces. So my guess would be that the the brand piece, the like really building the brand and the community and the reason why consumers want to be wearing a certain fashion and what that means about how they identify themselves. I can imagine that's a big part of what you did and then what you're teaching other entrepreneurs to do as well. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, the conversation and messaging is huge because again, 2010, we're talking like no one knew what sustainable fashion was okay, well, how do you educate the consumer to at least start to grasp? Yes, it's complicated, but start to understand, okay, this is what I'm looking for. This is how I can ask a brand these questions. Um, But so much of the evolution of the consumer, at least to the point where we have a small group of people who understand sustainable Mm -hmm. fashion and want it, like seek it out. I mean, there's a community that only buy sustainable fashion. Um, that has come from these smaller brands constantly messaging on mm-hmm. Instagram, their email list, writing blog posts, doing podcast interviews, YouTube videos, like all of that content marketing that helps not only them sell, of course, their products, but also communicate why it's important. And so that education has been absolutely critical. And that's why when people ask me, like, do we really need another sustainable fashion brand or like a fashion brand? Do we need another fashion startup? Um, Like, I'm like, what's the alternative? Because it's thanks to those Mm -hmm. brands that people even are starting to think about making more conscious shopping decisions. Mm, Gosh, I love that because I actually feel like there's so many pieces that you're talking about that are so relevant to fundraisers as they think about their nonprofit. And this piece around creating problem aware audiences, right? That if you are breaking into a market and the nonprofit market, you know, you may be sharing a message or sharing a certain amount of education that's meeting people at all different like awareness levels. So like your the the sort of clients of these brands, there are folks who might read that content and be ready to purchase, but other people are going to be digesting that content maybe for a year and it's just going to be start, starting to like turn the knob in their head around like this is a thing. I could be more conscientious when I'm buying my clothing. And so how do you like support, because I know you do a lot inside your work around, you know, supporting these entrepreneurs to build this brand and, and build this content piece. How do you support them to like meet a variety of people sort of where they're at? Yeah, it's, it's, it's complicated. I think one thing is identifying their target customer niche, which we focus Mm. on a lot. Like who is your ideal target customer and not trying to appeal to everyone, because if you try to appeal to everyone, you'll appeal to no one. So identifying who you're talking to and then figuring out what level you need to meet them at. And of Mm. course there will be varying degrees, but you know, it could be as simple as like, there's one, like, Instagram grid post that's super simple and straightforward. And then you can dive deeper through an Instagram live or an Instagram story. Mm. Um, So I think so much of what I do when I teach my brands is the marketing piece, of course, because we are selling a physical product. But through that, I also say sustainability can never be your number one marketing method. It can't Mm. be the first thing. It can't be the first reason someone buys from you, but there are ways, there are little touch points that you can incorporate through all of your other marketing that communicates that message. And like you said, it's kind of like these little touch points that happen, maybe it's over a year, but eventually it kind of gets through. Mm. I love that. And I'm curious, before we sort of clicked record, you had said this thing that I thought was really interesting around how many people sort of come into your network and are also wondering about partnering with nonprofits. And it's striking me a little bit because I think about these entrepreneurs who are working with you to create sustainable and ethical fashion, um, 
options from the beginning. So they already have this sort of social conscious mindset. And perhaps some people would believe that means they're more likely to want to partner with nonprofits, but it could also mean, in my opinion, that they are less likely because they feel like that's the core of their business model. So talk to me a little bit about how your folks think about cross-sector partnerships. What have you seen go really well in that space? What has just been a dumpster fire? Like just (laughs) tell us all the things. (laughs) Um, So in a general sense, well, yes, you're right. Like I would say there's two camps. One is I want to partner with a nonprofit from the beginning, like a lot come in, they're only at idea stage and they already know the nonprofit that they want to partner with Mm. and give, and a lot of it is like give a percentage of proceeds. And so what I say is, okay, that's great, but we need to make sure you have a margin. You Mm. have, you have costs, you have your cost of goods sold, and then you have your retail price. Somewhere in that margin, you need to be able to sustain your business. You need Mm. to be able to grow your business. And then let's talk about donating a percentage of whatever's left over to a nonprofit. But if that means dipping too far into your margin, that your business is going to go under after a Mm. year or two, then that's not serving anyone. That doesn't serve the nonprofit, first of all, Mm. because what they got like a few hundred bucks in your first year and then the partnership's over. And it doesn't serve you because you don't have a business anymore. Um, So that's a really, really important part of it. And I think that, you know, there are so many like different, you can like offset your carbon, you know, Mm. footprint, you can incorporate like all these different things. Now you can donate a percentage of proceeds. um, But I just, my emphasis is on making sure it's a healthy business first. And then to your point, some of the brands are like, all right, well, I'm incorporating this sustainable packaging and this sustainable fabric and my workers are already paid, you know, $2 more than the average sewer. So like that part of it, or they're working with a factory that's a cooperative and all the workers Mm. get a revenue share. So like that, there's that element. So I think it can, Mm. it can come from a few different angles. Mm. I love that. And I'm curious, I want to dig a little bit deeper around this like margin question, because one of the things that I've been really exploring with corporate partnerships in particular is there is, I mean, and particularly around some of the types of corporate engagements we're talking about where there's like a give back model or percentage of sales and, you know, things like that. And, and I've seen great success with like, you know, checkout, um, plugins with Shopify and things like that. And we have, we have an awesome, um, partner who supports a lot of our nonprofits, um, with that. And so I'm curious, like, how could a nonprofit help with that margin by creating a really intentional strategic partnership from the beginning where some of the other costs associated with business like marketing or audience acquisition or all of these different things where the nonprofit supports the business in certain ways so that it's less about um so that it's less about okay when you're when you have when you have this margin that's the time to incorporate a nonprofit as opposed to how can we partner in a way where we're like utilizing folks who believe the same things as us who overlap in audience with us and really build that into sort of strategic marketing what do you think about that i think that is what you said it's the marketing and customer acquisition that's where they can help because until you can I mean, there's an economy of scale in manufacturing too, where the higher your volume is, the, your price, your cogs, your cost Mm -hmm. of goods sold comes down. And Mm. so if we can get more customers and up that sales volume and thus the manufacturing volume, then that would help, uh, create a better margin for, for the product and for the brand. So I think that the exposure and the marketing piece, the customer ask for, yeah, customer acquisition piece is is probably what would be most helpful. Mm-hmm. And do you feel like in your experience, if you've had any experiences like that, and whether they've been at the beginning or, you know, at a midpoint, once that margin is sort of defined, 
do you feel like there are some practices that you've seen nonprofits utilize that have been really beneficial in building this sort of like mutually beneficial partnership and some things you've seen happen that have perhaps like damaged relationships in some way or made made it so that they are these kind of one-time things but don't feel good in terms of being incorporated into the long-term strategy of the company? I don't know. I don't know if I have like enough anecdotal data for that. I mean, I will say like the bigger the nonprofit's platform is, obviously mm. that is a huge, What if they have, you know, a multi, multi thousand person email list or a very large Instagram following, or they do have a YouTube channel. I think there are all these sort of, I do think when a nonprofit can think in a business minded way in terms of marketing, whether that is starting your own YouTube channel or your own podcast and like figuring out how to build your platform, then it just in general is going to be a better experience for any partner, whether that is a for-profit or nonprofit par partner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do. We do something called asset mapping um, inside my course. And that is definitely one of the types of assets that we talk about. And I think particularly you were talking about sort of the education piece where so much of the burden has fallen on companies to both be using their content strategy from a marketing perspective and like sales perspective, but also the education around the problem in the first place. And to me, that seems, and I'm sure this depends on the size of the company and all these other pieces, but to me, that seems like also such an easy place for nonprofits to support because they're often incredibly familiar with the problem and mm -hmm. messaging the problem and bringing in, you know, new folks to care about the problem. Um, so it does feel like there might be like a natural opportunity there. Yeah. And even when the nonprofit can, is like constantly messaging that problem and then can say, and here's a solution or mm -hmm. here are some solutions. Um, and they happen to be one of our partners or whatever mm -hmm. it is. Um, yeah. I think that's always a, a great thing. I'm curious, um, about the sort of journey that these entrepreneurs go on inside your program and, the, I know that you shared about your experience on Kickstarter and there are certain types of sort of startup financing, um, support that you provide inside your program. I'm really curious about like kind of the emotional components around sales and like what happens when some of the folks inside your course go from this idea, this vision, especially perhaps those really rooted in the impact and sort of like the sustainable and ethical practices, how they feel, frankly, kind of translating that the, that mission and that goal into selling a product? Like, do you see resistance there? Like, talk to me about that. Yeah. It's funny you asked this because I did a live show and interviewed someone about this very thing. Um, and we were talking about this in terms of just like the, uh, yeah, that kind of like tension between I need to sell because that's what makes it a business and not a hobby, but also, you know, the, like the consumer culture, not feeding into that consumer feeding frenzy. Mm. And I think what we came up with, it's kind of like back to what I said, kind of, you know, in the beginning is we need the brands, the for profits, the businesses, the people selling who care about other mm. things like so who have the social impact element or care about you know donating a portion to a nonprofit whatever it is um and so really it's coming to terms with the fact that you are providing a solution to a problem and so that's what I always say to my entrepreneurs. We're not creating another t-shirt brand. We're not creating another, mm. you know, yeah, screen printed t-shirt. We're creating problem products that solve problems for our customers. And that's one of the first things we do is we identify the ideal target customer, that niche, that person who we're solving the problem for, and then the solution to the problem that we've identified. So it's really like a, a separation from this idea of like, 
trends and fast fashion and just buy it because it's five dollars and it's going to make you feel good for one night and then you're going to throw it into your closet it's like looking at it from almost like a tech perspective. You have all these like tech companies, Mm -hmm. right? Where it's like, okay, identify the problem first and then create the solution around that problem. That's kind of what we're trying to reinvent with, with the sustainable fashion industry. Wow. Okay. I love that. And I want to ask you a little bit of a loaded question, but I'm just going to say that I I'm not saying this from a, from a place of my beliefs, but I'm just curious if your folks or you get this pushback and then we can talk a little bit because I think there's some overlap here with fundraisers, but I'm curious, do you get folks who come and say, well, really from a sustainability perspective, what we need is less objects being created and how do you and your, um, and the folks that you work with sort of manage that feedback when it comes in. Yeah, of course we get this question and this uh, feedback for sure. And I sort of equate it to climate change. Like you look at the government tells us, okay, we, well, we have to have shorter showers. Everyone take, you have to limit your own water use when really it's like the multi-billion dollar corporations the animal agriculture, the, the the oil, like all of that stuff is far worse for like that, that curbing that would do far more for the planet than us shortening our showers. Right. And so I look at that with sustainable fashion brands too. It's fast fashion. It's Amazon. It's Walmart. It's like that Mm. churn of especially, you know, the H and M's of the world, the forever 21s of the world saying, bye, 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 sale, 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 $5, $5, $5, that Mm. is what is going to have a bigger impact than saying, oh, okay, well, we don't need another sustainable fashion brand. So like, let's just get rid of all the fashion startups. Mm. That's what I thought you were going to say. And, um, (laughs) and I, and I really appreciate you saying it because I think this is something that happens a lot. You know, there is this, um, there are these like feelings about sales and fundraising and money just in general. And particularly, I think for women who have been told for generations that talking about money is inappropriate. Mm -hmm. And then they finally have the courage to talk about money and perhaps to sell something that's super meaningful to them or to fundraise for a cause that's super meaningful to them. And then they hear some naysayer messages and it can really like shake you to mm-hmm. your core. I'm sure you've had those days. I've had those days and, um, of just like, and so I think it's like one, just like important to kind of normalize that for people who are just starting out that like, these are like, this, these are loaded activities and words. And they're oftentimes very emotional, especially if you've been staying up till 2 AM trying to build your business and then you get one of those comments. And so just to say that, like, we've been there and that it's okay. And I'm just curious if you have anything to add to that. And then I want to sort of connect what you said in response to something I think is really relevant to fundraisers too. Yeah. And I I think that it's, it's about like the value you're bringing. It's about the value, not just in the product or the, the foundation or the fundraiser. It's about like what you're you know, if you're employing people, if you, Mm. you know, people, I get pushed back about this, about, um, you know, the, to the cost of tuition for my program. Mm. And I am like, sorry, I'm not going to apologize for it because I know the value. I know Mm. it brings exponentially more value than what it costs. And I have a team of people to support like families Mm. to help support and to make sure that they stay employed. And, Mm. you know, so like there's such a bigger picture to the whole money conversation that it's not just about like raising $10 or selling this garment for Mm. $90 or whatever it is. Like there's, you have to look at the value from a higher level than just what you're seeing on a computer screen or, you know, in a retail store. Mm. Okay. I, I love that you're, I love what you're talking about right now. And I want to go deeper here on this because I'm curious how you think about this, because I feel like I, I fall into sometimes this difficult space around this piece of the conversation where I don't want to over justify prices around something, because I just want to be able to say, 
that's the price. Mm-hmm. And, and do what you're doing, which is to say, and I'm paying all of these people. And I feel like as women too, we sort of have these, have this constant, you know, pull around, like, I just want to like sit in my self-worth, but I also want to explain to you why I'm worth it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I'm curious, like just what that's been like for you as an entrepreneur and as a mom, even, I mean, I know I think about my daughter so much sometimes when I'm like navigating that space and I'm like, what would I want her to like think or say right now, or how would I want her to sit like embodied in her value? And so I know you're also coaching and supporting all these other people to do this, but I'm just curious, like your own experience with it. Yeah, I think that I've come a long way. Like I certainly (laughs) didn't start out with this, like confidence of this mentality, Um, you know, and I think it comes with experience. Do I, should I, you know, be charging what I'm charging back in 2014 when I was just starting out? No, probably mm. not. But as you build your experience and as you bring on team members with experience, you know, we have a whole group of alumni mentors who have already launched their brands. They're offering one-on-one mentorship to people who want to do what they're doing. Mm. Like that's a whole other value set mm. um, that you really can't put a price tag on. So I think as you start to get more self-assured in, again, the value you're providing and you start to hear feedback, like, you know, this was worth more than my MBA. Mm. This is the most value I've ever received, which we hear all the time. Then it builds up that confidence for you. Um, Mm. And that, you know, I hate to say it, but like for someone just starting out, it's going to be harder for you and that's Mm. okay. Just expect that. And then as you gain experience. And as you grow into your role, you're going to accumulate this feeling of, uh, yeah, I'm worth what I'm worth, what I, um, charge. Mm. And I think that just applies to fundraising in so many different ways. I mean, one, just around the practice, you know, it's a little bit different in terms of like your hourly rate, isn't necessarily going up, but just in that practice of saying big numbers, you know, or, or I remember when I was, um, the managing director of an organization, we, we made a silly mistake and it cost us a thousand dollars. And the executive director was just like losing his marbles about it. (laughs) And I was like, okay, I get it. Like, but you know what? It's really good that we made this mistake right now. And it was a thousand dollars. Cause actually if we had made this mistake, when we grow, it could have been a $10,000 mm-hmm. mistake or a hundred thousand dollar mistake. And so this was actually like a great investment of us learning this lesson. And I think just as you know, nonprofits are starting to raise more money. You're going to start to say bigger and bigger numbers. You know, you're not a tiny little hundred thousand dollar nonprofit is not going to go in and ask for $5 million probably tomorrow, but you're going to say the number that feels like it's pushing, pushing the boundary for you. And that number is going to continue to grow. And then just like with sales, you're going to say the number you're going to stop talking and you're going to let the other person make a decision. And I just, I mean, I know, you know, how uncomfortable those moments can be right. Of wanting to be like, because for that thousand dollars, we're going to do blah, 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 blah. And we work with fundraisers so much around saying like, would you be interested in investing a thousand dollars in that and stopping and just like sitting with it and recognizing that the answer might be yes, the answer might be no. But I also think your point that's so well taken. And this is why meetings with donors are so critical fundraisers is because to start to get some of that positive feedback around the investment in your organization was one of the most meaningful investments I've ever made. You know, going to see the program in action was one of the most life-changing experiences I've ever had. Those data points that those anecdotes, those stories that really does help build your confidence the next time then you're inviting someone new to invest in that way. So I love, I love that you shared all of that. Yeah. And I just want to say, echo your point, which is like a thousand dollars to one person is different than a thousand dollars to another Mm. person. And so also like remembering that you can't predict the, Mm. the answer or the outcome. Just like you said, you have to stop and just be like, this is what I charge, or this is what, you know, we're asking Mm. for and, and just let it be and it be okay with it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think creating space for people to talk about like sales is not 
bad. Sure. Doing sales in a particular way might be really cringy. Doing fundraising in a particular way can be really cringy, but doing fundraising from a place of alignment and values is not cringy. And same with sales. I even had an experience I've shared a little bit recently where on my, my birthday for my course, I actually offered a scholarship that was like related to, you know, how old I was turning and actually made it so that I was breaking even pretty much on the course. And I got an email back, but I really wanted to do it as just like this birthday thing. I don't know for myself. And I got an email back from somebody that says, this is just another slimy sales tactic. (laughs) And I ended up writing this guy, a pretty long email. And I just said, you know, look, first of all, um, actually at this scholarship level, I'm not making any money on this, but I didn't put that in my first email because I don't believe that selling something is bad just because I don't believe that fundraising is bad. I believe my course provides a solution to a problem and I'm really proud of it. And I'm really proud that people invest money in themselves and in their organizations because that buy-in also moves, starts to move money for them. And so I just think there's just this, this much bigger conversation as you're talking about that. I just really want to echo, which is like, we need to be able to like zoom out, be real with ourselves around our own, like money beliefs, not project that onto tons of other people. And to recognize that sometimes like money needs to move in alignment with our values, even when it is maybe selling something we don't feel like we personally need because it's solving a bigger problem that we might not even be able to see. Yeah. Yeah. I completely agree. What do you, um, what are some of the like piece of it, pieces of advice that you give to like new entrepreneurs and that I'm sure would also just be so relevant to folks. There's so many similarities between starting a business and starting a nonprofit or being in startup phase and business startup phase and nonprofit. What's some of the like baseline advice you give folks? Um, it's just about putting one foot in front of the other. Like every, all the time I'll get questions like, what's your favorite idea that, you know, who, which entrepreneur in your program has the best idea this year? Or like, what are some Mm. of the projects that are like really cool that people are working on? And I'm like, if, if I judge the ideas, like I wouldn't have predicted like Crocs would be a billion (laughs) dollars. So like, I am not in the business of judging ideas. I am the business of choosing entrepreneurs that I feel are going to take action because the single Mm. most important quality of an entrepreneur, of a fundraiser, of whoever, like really whoever is the ability to take action. And Mm. so often we just talk ourselves into these like procrastination spirals Mm -hmm. that we think we need everything to be perfect on these like nitty gritty little things that are not going to move the needle in any way. And it's really the people who like see the bigger picture and are able to map that out. And of course I help them map that out, but can take the next step. Um, Yeah. And I think that applies literally to probably anything in life. Yeah. I'm so glad you said that. Um, because I totally agree. I read something the other day that said procrastination is not a time management issue. It's an emotional management issue. And it's just so much like the chatter that we hear. And we do a lot of work like on this podcast, sort of talking about what are the narratives we're telling ourselves? How are they holding us back? How are they getting in the way of taking action? But I'm really curious. I I kind of want to double click on what you just said around the perfectionist piece and some of the perhaps like little details that people hyper analyze Mm -hmm. or get, what are some of the things that come up in, in your world that people just really, really focus on? You're like, that's not the point at all. The logo. (laughs) Oh God. (laughs) I'm like, pick a font and that's your logo. You know, like, of course it's a little bit different with fashion. Like you, you know, branding is a huge piece Mm -hmm. and I'm not trying to like undermine that. Um, but when you're first starting out, it's just so much more important to start building your audience and just have Mm. something up online so you can start collecting email addresses, 
start building a social media following and uh, the logo, like font scheme, mm -hmm. color scheme. Those are all things that people just like love to like get really nitty gritty with. And uh, it, yeah, it holds you back because you think it's the illusion of productivity if you spend three hours on Canva, but it's not, it's not actual productivity. Fundraisers, I hope you heard that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, what you're saying is obviously something that we deal with so, so, so much in this sector too. And I mean, I'm curious what you think about that. When you were sharing that with me, I'm like, well, is the focus on brand and font that hyper focus? Is it really just folks avoiding visibility? Yeah. And it's, I get it. Like it is scary. It is you know, we worry so much. It's not even like the trolls of social media, which is obviously mm. scary, the comments <laughs> and all of that, but it's like our friends and family mm -hmm. and, you know, like, oh, I just graduated with my master's. People are going to like, why wonder why I'm like now starting a business or like, mm. we like create these stories in our heads that like, fine, maybe like your great aunt Mildred, like would feel this way, but you, you know, like no one else mm. does. Like we like, pick out these like, yeah, these stories that most people are probably not thinking about or, mm. you know, and everyone does it. And I, you know, I can still do this at times being in this game for, you know, 10 years, there's still times that it's like the monkey mind. So totally. um, yeah, totally. How did you navigate that early on? Like when you had, cause I feel that I experienced that a lot too, I can sort of tell in my body and my mind when I'm hitting a new level of visibility because mm -hmm. all the chatter gets real loud. Like it's like, I maybe can address my imposter syndrome, like where I currently sit, but then I always know when I'm sort of breaking, when I'm up leveling, because mm -hmm. it all comes like flooding back. And I have my sort of set of tools that I've talked about a lot on here, but what are some of the things you do when you when you get those sensations or those narratives, um, in order to keep going. Yeah. I keep a Google doc of like mm. testimonials from past students who like, they're just like rave reviews, people that, you know, will say like this program changed my life or like whatever it mm. is. And I'll go, I'll open that and I'll read through like all the positive stuff. Um, but I will say like, in terms of visibility, the, really the thing that helped me was hiring someone to manage all the content, all the social media. So I'm just not on it. You know, like I'm just not looking at every single Instagram DM. I'm not looking at every single Instagram comment or YouTube comment. Mm. Um, there's a bit of a filter now and that, you know, that's only recent within the last year, but it, that's been pretty uh, life-changing. That's awesome. I have a few per things in my business that now no longer come to me yeah. um, just because just to sort of save me or allow me to read those things when I'm in the right headspace to read them and like enter into that, that from a place of choice and not yeah. just feeling like it's, you know, kind of hitting me um, throughout the day, all day, every day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I like talk, I'm talking about this and I'm like, I can't even think of like one negative thing. I mean, knock on wood, of course, tomorrow yeah. I'll, I'll get a negative comment, but <laughs> um, like this is not like this happens a lot, yeah. but I think it's just like the separation of self, which is something that I have had to really process mm. and overcome this past year is I am not my business. I run my business mm. or I am not my nonprofit. I run the nonprofit mm. or I am not the, the funds that I raise. I am mm. just running that. So I think separation from whether it is like, you know, whether it is your business or whether it is a job or task you're doing, like you, that is not your identity. Yeah. 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 I think that's really important. And, you know, I mean, I can imagine that now probably your business and your work is more, has a bigger kind of following than 10 years ago. I mean, I ran an yeah. environmental literacy organization 10 years ago. I, I mean, holy moly, like we yeah. try to talk about some of these topics and it was just like doors, 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 doors. And so I feel like you probably did 
historically deal with a lot more rejection or lack of interest um, and found ways to like move through that. And I think for change makers in general, something I say to nonprofit folks all the time is like, look, like your work is inherently challenging. You are challenging the status quo. You, that is the whole purpose, right? Of this sector is to be writing yeah. wrongs existing around us that there's no way everyone's going to be on board for for that because there are certain people benefiting from the status quo that you're trying to disrupt that I'm trying to disrupt and so that's just like for me like a big part of like grounding in my why is like yeah not at, like I remember the first time on this podcast I got it like three star or something and like I someone sent it to me like appalled and I was like yes like finally, like, like that to me is a good sign. Like I am pushing the envelope. That is why I'm here. I'm not here just to make everyone happy. Like there are enough, there's enough of that. If I wanted to just kind of like play into that status quo. So I, I think I really appreciate you sharing just some of the, the ways that you navigate that as you've been growing. I want to ask you before we, before we head off, I know you're also a mom and probably balancing so many things behind the scenes that a lot of the people who are listening to this can relate to. And I'm just curious how that has played into your journey and sort of how you think about that, you know, in relation to sort of where you're going and the folks you support. I know you support a lot of women who are probably in similar life stages too. So will you just talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, I, it's really like, I mean, motherhood is like obviously so challenging and like being an entrepreneur and being a mom is challenging. I will say in terms of like time management, it is the best thing that's ever happened because mm -hmm. it's really like my son is at school from 8.30 to 2.30. Like that's the time I get. Um, mm. And everything I need to get done happens within that time. And then like the computer goes away, the phone goes away and I'm with him until he goes to bed at seven. So I think that whereas before I became a mom, there was like this tendency to like drag things out or like reopen mm. the computer at night. And like, of course, depending on what stage of entrepreneurship you're in, you may still have to do that. Like if you're in startup mode or I keep saying entrepreneur, but this relates yeah. to fundraisers too. Of course, um, yeah. Then you know, it's going to be varying degrees of this, but I do think that time management piece and like having that container has been really helpful. Um, but yeah, it's just, I don't know. I think it's one of those things where you just let things slide a little bit easier mm -hmm. um, when challenges come up or like, you know, the negative stuff or like the self doubt. It's like, you don't have as much time to dwell in it. You don't mm. have as much time to just like dwell in your shit because, mm. <laughs> because you have to just like move on and kind mm -hmm. of like, like compart compartmentalize that and then move on to something else. Um, mm. Yeah, the whole perspective I think really changes when you become a mom and just like things that used to bother you wouldn't, wouldn't bother mm. you anymore. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Do you deal with a lot of um, folks like trying to get their businesses off the ground or to a certain place before they enter motherhood? Do you see that a lot? I get a lot of people who are like pregnant or like they're like in their mm -hmm. maternity leave. I'm like, you guys are the achievers, like Enneagram threes <laughs> for sure. Um, because, oh my gosh, I was like, all right, maternity leave three months, like setting it up. <laughs> um, but no, I, I, it is, it's a, the moms are the best, like the, to work mm -hmm. with the moms. Um, they're just like efficient and they just like, are, they're action takers and mm. um yeah I, I, some some like have kids like you know starting kindergarten and so now they have all this free time or again like they just have they see like maternity mm. leave from their full-time job so that's like an opportunity to try something new um but it's always fun to work with them Mm, I love that. I mean, it's been something I've been thinking about in my own sort of career progression or like business progression. And, um, my daughter's two and a half and, 
you know, of course, everyone's asking about where the next one is. And I'm just like, well, I had it and it's called power partners and it's a course. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it's a little business, over a yeah. year old, <laughs> um, but you know, it's, it's a funny, it's a funny like thing to, to sort of like navigate all the moving pieces, but I totally agree with you. I think it has also given me space and distance around like what really matters and doesn't allow me to sort of obsess about the, the small stuff. And and like, just kind of ground in my why really related to her. Um, although I'll, I'll tell you, I'm very nervous for losing daycare. That's like all year round. I literally just said to my husband, I said, so what do we do during the summer? Or like, <laughs> yeah. what do we do when she's in public school and it ends at two or three? Like wh- what? I know. <laughs> totally. So yeah, just a whole, just all the things that I think, um, you know, women, and moms are navigating in and parents in so many different ways. And, um, and it's awesome to have spaces and communities like yours. I know that's a big thing that you offer your folks are these like community components. Um, so I don't know if you want to say anything about, about that and then just tell folks, you know, I want to be sensitive to time where they can find you, how they can learn more for those who are interested. Um, and so if you want to share about some of the community as a part of that, that would be great too. Yeah. So, I mean, of course, a community when you're starting anything new or, you know, you're not in that world um, from your day job or whatever it is, I think just the camaraderie and the like constant echoes of, yes, I'm going through that too, or, oh yeah, that's normal. That happened to me or whatever it is, um, the support and then like the accountability piece too, to see Mm. like, oh, that person completed like that milestone in getting Mm. closer to, you know, X outcome for me, you know, it's starting up, starting a fashion brand, but all of that I think is so important. They say like, like, I don't know, 60% of online courses are never even opened. Mm. And so making sure that if you are going to enroll that you're enrolling in something like a program. It's more than just a self-study course so that you have that community accountability. And of course, um, with Factory 45, we have the alumni mentorship piece and the mentorship Mm. from me. Um, So anyone who is interested in starting a sustainable fashion or accessories brand um, can learn more about Factory 45 at factory45.co. Awesome. And then I don't know, I invite everyone to um, share a nonprofit that's near and dear to their heart as well. Do you have one in mind you'd like to have folks check out? Oh man. Yeah. Together Rising is the one that I donate to every month, um, which I'm sure everyone probably knows. (laughs) Well, we'll send information um, about Together Rising Below is the one started by um, Glennon Doyle and um, does a lot of like urgent relief work and a variety of different sort of community, community centric approaches to, um, to funding initiatives that aren't always getting sort of the attention of other organizations or is there anything else about them you'd love to, to share? Um, I'm trying to remember when I first found it was some after, you know, some disaster, I think, or maybe actually it was uh, the immigration crisis at the border um, and everything that was going on. But I just like that um, they, so like the people who run the organization are funded separately. So, or like their Mm. salaries are paid separately so that all your donation is going towards the actual cause or the people who need it. Um, mm. I, kn- I know there's, you know, that's probably something you get a lot of pushback <laughs> on in the nonprofit world is like the red tape and all of the like, you know, registration fees and things that have to get paid for too. And like, mm-hmm. where did your money actually go? So um yeah, we could have a whole separate conversation about that. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and delete all of this if you're like together rising is not a good organization. And no, then no, send no. me a separate I, you know, email. No, no, no. <laughs> I think it's a great organization. And it's actually, I've actually wanted to have them come on to talk about this component because I think the 100% model is wildly successful on an organization by organization basis, but can be really hard on a sector wide basis. Mm -hmm. And so I think it is about just like a growing consciousness around why are we asking those questions and what does it mean? And it probably relates in so many ways to your work, right? It's like, 
as your, as the businesses are starting to separate out, like, you know, okay, this is how much are going to these workers. And this is how much it's like at the end of the day, it's all coming together to create the product that has been defined as being the most important product to solve a specific problem. And that's the way I want people to think about the nonprofit sector too, which is it doesn't really matter how much is going to the staff or going to this. If the product, the program is moving the needle the way that it's intended, that's the point, you know? And so I think these are growing conversations inside and around the sector. So I'm actually really glad that you brought it up because I think it's an awesome thing for us to, to constantly be talking about. Cool. Well, I'll keep an eye out for that episode. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for coming on and having this conversation with me today and for all of the incredible work that you do. Um, I really, um, yeah, I'm so grateful to get to know you and have this conversation. And thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure.